Hello and welcome to another I Work in Sport live interview. This is the show where we talk to accomplished sport business professionals who come here to share their knowledge, experience, tips and advice in order to help you succeed in your career. My name is Jean Frigerio. Um, I'm the founder of I Work in Sport. And if you don't know what I Work in Sport is, we're a platform made to help you boost your career in sport. We basically connect talents and recruiters, especially, but not only, through a series of events, uh, while we also promote uh, career growth and education always in sport. So check out um, our website, iworkinsport.com. Let me find that, it should be right here. There you go. Uh, you can also find us in our social media channels. We're everywhere, um, at iworkinsport, uh, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, of course, um, I mentioned the events. Uh, one of the events that are coming up is the Education Virtual Expo. You just saw a teaser, a short video uh, before uh, the show. Uh, we have news programs, programs confirmed. There is a link in the description for you to, to, to register. If you are interested in you know, boosting your career in sport and if you're looking for education in sports, check it out. It's free. Um, uh, yeah, so I really recommend you check that event out. Um, anyway, thank you to everyone that is uh, joining us. Uh, so slowly, if you could let us know where you're watching from, that would be great, right? Um, please say hello in the in the chat. Let, as I said, let, let us know where you're watching from. Um, prepare your questions. Always, normally, the well, always I would say even the the best questions come from you, not from me. And if you could, of course, you know, hit that uh, like button, uh, subscribe to the channel, hit the the bell icon if you want to get the notifications. That would be great as well. Uh, now let me introduce my guest. We're going to talk today with uh, Geraldine Bernardo, um, also known as Dina. She is a leading figure in the development of women's sports in the Philippines. Uh, she's got a bachelor in physical therapy, a master in business management, and was a quite successful athlete too. For instance, she won two gold medals at uh, the Southeast Asian Games as the captain of the Philippines women's dragon boat team, right? Have you ever heard about dragon boats? Do you know what that is? Let me know in the comments if you know what that is. If you don't, we'll talk about it. She'll, she'll explain that to you. She's uh, held several influential positions at uh, organizations such as the Philippine Olympic Committee Athletes, Athletes Commission and the Philippine Sports Commission. And among many other things that we're going to talk about during the interview, she also founded the Sports Management Council of the Philippines. She's been a big promoter of uh, grassroots sports and uh, women empowerment in several communities. And she is the leading person behind SWEEP, which stands for Sports for Women's Empowerment and Employment Program. Uh, that event will happen next week. We're going to talk uh, a lot about that. Well, and so many other things. I think there's a lot to unpack there. So let's get to it. I'm going to invite uh, Dina to join me here right after this. Hello, Dina, how are you? I am great, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. <laughs> uh, was, was it okay? Did, did I say anything um, that I shouldn't? <laughs> well, it's all there, so I can't deny it. That's um, great, that's I, great. I, I do, do want to say that I, I can't say I'm the leading. I, I think there are so many enablers and supporters out there who are women in sports. 
so I can't take claim for being the leading. Okay, cor cor correction is made. <laughs> um, listen, uh, Dina, before we start, uh, with, before I ask questions, why don't we, uh, why don't you give us a summary of your career? Well, thank you. Um, I, I, I should say my foray into sports started pretty late. I was first, like you mentioned, a physical therapist. I went to business and uh, we created several companies with my husband. And somewhere along the way, we had business issues with a partner. So if you want tips on getting partners, let me know. And so I found myself in uh, like wanting to get respite or wanting to relieve ourselves of the stress. I found myself in a dragon boat team, just a club um, in our city. And I liked it because, you know, I'm half Chinese and the sport resonated in our culture, in the Chinese culture anyway, not knowing that I was competitive. Besides, I was really above the age limit of a typical athlete. I was in my late 30s. But, you know, I had a fit lifestyle. I, I, I ate right. I would carry my 200-pound husband for exercise. So I was pretty strong. And not knowing that, well, I said, well, why don't we take it a little further? I joined the national team. I made it, uh, became the team captain. And I suppose the rest is history. But coming in as a more mature, more mature player and having had my master's degree, then I... I, I would say I had a fantastic internship. So I was an athlete. So I, I got involved with our national governing body. I, I learned all these regulations because that's what you do, right? You study an industry. You, you look at all the factors, what makes it work, uh, in and out. So I would say I had a pretty good internship. So from the NGO, the Philippine Olympic Committee, as well as the government. So I was in government for a while. So I, I right. think I... I ran the whole circle. Right. Um, and so what is it that you like the most about uh, working in, in, in sport then? And, and, I, and I think also you, you, you missed, I think, many other areas that we're going to talk about. Uh, some of the, um, uh, the, the, the positions that you, have, you worked in, some, um, uh, some projects that you developed including the one with the U.S. sort of State Department. We're going to talk about that um, um, in, in a bit. But in general, about working in sport, what is it that you like the, the most? Um, personally, uh, I imagine for, for a person my age to have found respite or relief from sports. And my world opened up in unimaginable ways. And uh, for anybody, for any sport-loving Filipino, there's always that ache, like, it could have been better. What could we do better? We have talented people, we have very passionate people. What is missing in the equation? And that's something that I kind of want to bring because at the end of the day, uh, managing sport is still basic management and leadership. And so, for me, personally, my mission is to help develop uh, competency at this level so that, you know, uh, when our time comes, then they will know what to do when they reach the top. Uh, I'm, I'm very inspired by the many people who beyond money or beyond their uh, usual capabilities would give for sport or would serve sport. So um, that's something I want to bring out in this country. Right. And explain now um, what are your roles in the sport? Because you're currently doing uh, several things. You're a lecturer. Um, you're organizing with um, Sports Phil, um, the organization that you founded that organizes uh, Sweep. So, yeah, give us a sense of what you're doing at the moment. Okay, so By the way, just just before you you, you go there, there's uh, some people saying hi uh, here. Um, hi Xiao, from China. Uh, she, 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 she Xiao Xiao and then she says, "Of course, she oh. knows the dragon boat." Ah. Uh, and then Shorty says, uh, "Good morning, good morning to you." Of course, and, she knows uh, dragon boat. It, it, in LinkedIn. Yeah, because. Sorry, go on. Uh, yeah, Dragon Boat is very famous in China. It's one of their main festivals. 
So, so tell b- b- before we go to, to that, to you explaining what you, um, what you do exactly right now, we we mentioned about Dragon Boat. Tell people what that is exactly and how do you compete? Okay, it's a paddling sport. So um, it's a long boat that has 10 pairs of paddlers and it is um, there's a drummer in front and a steersman at the back. So it's it's all about steering a boat and it's the ultimate team sport. And Football, I basketball. <laughs> Is the boat decorated as a dragon? Yes, that's the traditional way. But when you think about it, many of our countries, you can talk about the Vikings or other festivals in the, the Asian archipelago, the snake boat or the swan boat in Thailand. So every, every country actually has their own traditional boat. It just so happens the format has been the dragon boat, perhaps because there are more players There are probably upwards of 50 million paddlers, and most of them can be found in China. So that's the more popular, I would say, in terms of number and popularity. Yeah. And but here we also have our own. Um, so it's it's probably in our DNA that we are paddlers in our ancestral past. And I like it because it's quick. You know, it's the most intense two minutes or five minutes, depending on the length of the race. And you are literally uh, as strong as the weakest link. And sometimes I even use Dragon Boat as a metaphor for managing an organization. So I, I say, okay, oh, because the, what is the objective in a Dragon Boat race? To reach there together in the fastest way possible. So you have a drummer which does the commands and you could look at that as the boss, right? And the steers person could be something like he's the one who's monitoring and evaluating, making sure that everybody's doing their job. And of course, you have the organizational members. Are Do they have the same vision? Are we moving in the same direction? So it's really great. I've had my master's students even like, okay, go to the Dragon Boat Race, uh, try it out and tell me, come back to me how it's like running an organization. Right. Uh, cool. Yeah, I, I've seen pictures and even a few a few videos. It look, looks like some sort of canoeing um, competition yes. or, or, or rowing. Um, yeah, but it's different. Any, it's it, different. It, anyway, tell us uh, about um, your sort of current roles as an academic, but also organizing uh, the sweep uh, event that we're going to talk about. Um, yeah and the other positions that you currently hold. Sure, thank you. So actually, I'm still a business person. Uh, that's not going to go away. But at the same time, I'm teaching uh, sport management as well as strategic management at the, at the private university over here. And I also have a nonprofit organization called Sportfill for short. And the mission is to uh, convene, uh, support, and enable... Um, um, organizations and professionals towards progressive sport development for the country. And one of the things that came as an offshoot of the need that we have is for women empowerment through sports. Thankfully, because of a program that I was fortunate enough to join in the U.S., it's a, you know, the U.S. also has sports diplomacy, how they use uh, sport for social change. So they would invite, and we had one specifically for women in sports, And so that really opened my eyes. Interestingly, even though I felt some marginalization as an athlete or as a woman in this country, I, I had to say it felt normal. And I think it had to take somebody else from outside to say, hey, this is a problem. And all the while I'm thinking, but this is the culture. And, and, and now, obviously, I think otherwise. And I've seen the power of sport, especially for, for women who are more like vulnerable or don't have access to opportunities. And so when, when we conceive this sweep, you see, it's not as simple as just empowering women through sport. That's just one component. We have not addressed, or we have to address also all these other parts of the ecosystem, whether it's generating sport activities at the community level, And now with the new normal considerations, how do we keep our children playing? 
so the 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 this the conference is really a wow a, a combination of all the things that we feel should be in the ecosystem and your part Zhao, obviously is to show the way that yes you can have careers in sport and we have also entrepreneurs there who have shown we have pivoted and this is what we can do in sport so it's it's really wow it's really ambitious and i and i hope when people come and and see they'd appreciate and take and have some takeaways so t t tell us more more what they can expect so is it a three-day event uh yes actually, it's a three i added the 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 link to to your site so where people can register in the description of the video if they're watching it on youtube yes so uh so that's uh, easy for for anyone that is interested in it so i recommend you go in and check it out so what they can expect so how long does it take how many sort of sessions you know what, what are some some example of uh the title of the the, the presentations Okay, so we have what we call program tracks, and each of these program tracks can take half a day. And so we, for example, sport and sports and fitness in the digital space. So what do you hope to expect in such a session? So we have people who showcase what they do for sport competitions, how they conduct them, whether it's martial arts or duathlons, or we will even have international organizations come and describe how they are uh promoting sports even uh as we are locked down in, in during the covid pandemic we also have the uh a mini sport boot camp so there are nuances or unique aspects of training women and girls in sport and we will show some of that we also need we also understand what that we need visibility so we have a lot of women panelists whether they have been in competition before and now are leaders in their own sport governing bodies we also have policy makers so that's that's pretty intense because we invited somebody from the state department from the malaysian government from a research group so just just to show to us how they are championing the women in sport agenda and so as right. you can see you can appreciate so you come in and probably it's like a menu okay i think i'll i can take advantage of that because that's within my realm I'm a researcher. I want to do more research for women's sports. So here you are. I'm a coach. I've been coaching women, but I'm not sure if I'm if I'm doing it right. So here's 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 something: how to overcome barriers for women's sport, or or how to do tests and measurements. And we also have a gamut of special sessions um, from from anywhere from uh, other coaching staff or other coaching institution from other countries. So it's really a lot. And, and the nice thing about this platform is that you enter, and of course, there's a lot of sessions, and you could still come back. We will, this program will still be around for viewing and reviewing until about December 31 of the year. Because it's really a lot. It's, it's actually almost impossible to sit through all of that. So you cool. will probably expect that people come in and out. We could still continue to network. There are virtual booths. Uh, we have other presentations and we're even thinking of some post event activities because just because we have that platform all the way throughout the year. Cool. Um, thank you for that. So Hardik is in India, says hi. So does uh, John Mark in, in Ghana. Uh, <coughs> so yeah, so as, as you mentioned, I will be uh, there uh, speaking at one session at uh, Sweep. So looking forward to that. And there, I will have my own tips to enter the market, right? But Amazing. what would you say are the biggest challenges for someone, say in the Philippines or, or in the region of uh, Southeast Asia to start working in sport? Well, I, um, I'll give some broad strokes, but definitely for this country, uh, I don't think we have a good sporting culture. So for sport business to thrive, then you need consumers. And these consumers are either there or, or need to be developed further. I, I think for the longest time, we're always thinking of sports like it's only for the elite. It's only for competition. But people don't realize it's participation and fitness forms part of that. Uh, now with the COVID, I think there is a good opportunity to, to use sport or physical fitness, especially to um, 
to take care of your mental health. So that's a challenge. Even when it comes to classifying sport businesses, we are kind of tucked under other major categories like arts, entertainment, and education. So it's the the classification of sport is also not not given importance. And so, and of course, um, they don't sport management as a discipline is also just in its infancy stage. I could there's probably just ten schools that offer sport management in the country. I used to teach in the master's degree for sport and recreation management until I think maybe the market was not catching up or not eating into it. So they even had to dissolve that program. So there's that's why for for like you, I work in sport. If there are other opportunities there, we are living in a seamless world and it's not that difficult anymore to get an education uh, elsewhere for sport management. Not to say that we shouldn't develop our own because there are definitely nuances here, contextual um, circumstances here that probably means that we should still have our own uh, our own brand of sport management, which is going to be different from the U.S., which is going to be different from Europe. Right, uh, but, but specifically then, so we're talking more in a, in, in a broader way, sort of the importance of uh, education, uh, as you mentioned, and I totally agree with you. I'm someone who did a, a master's in sport. Uh, this is how I launched my career in it over 15 years ago. And yeah, thoroughly recommend it. Um, we're currently, as, is, as I mentioned before, organizing an event promoting education where people can go for free and talk to some of the best masters in sports uh, in the world. But also there will be, you don't have to uh, be interested in, in a master degree. Uh, you can, if you just want to find some maybe online options, uh, you can go there as well. And the cool thing is that you'll be talking to 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 not only the representatives of the courses, uh, the administration, the people, the staff, but also with alumni. So that's uh, that's pretty cool as well. But uh, in 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 terms of my my experience is that uh, I know some people that actually did some of these uh, programs, invested in education, and still find uh, difficulties to, to get a job. Especially, uh, for instance, I, I know a couple in the Philippines, uh, for instance, what, what can they do if they go and if they even invest in education, how can, what's, uh, how can one actually start working in, in sport there? Uh, good question, but uh, maybe I'm biased, but uh, um, perhaps one of the ways to get into it is actually in the realm of entrepreneurship. If there's a need out there, are you able to fill that need as opposed to just uh, getting a job? Because when you think about it in, in, uh, in a particular, for example, if you count the number of businesses, 99% is composed of small and medium enterprises. Only a few percent are the big corporations. So if the corporations don't have those jobs, then can you start something as a venture? Small, medium, I mean, that we have a lot of small, medium entrepreneurs here. So why can't you also be in sport entrepreneurship? So sport entrepreneurship has been a focus of my uh, research and as well as athlete entrepreneurship as I'm taking my doctorate right now because there are very unique opportunities. People who enter sport entrepreneurship are really a, a, a breed of their own. They come in because they say, okay, I love sport. I think I want to go into sport. I want to earn in sport. If I can, how do I do it? So I'd, I'd really love to see the time that we can um, probably show what will, what are the precursors to getting people into sport entrepreneurship. So yeah. can we make the can we make a need? Can we fulfill a need? Can we meet that need? So what do you think, Zhao? No, I think that that's correct. I I have sort of a lecture that I give to I give in so many presentations and I outline um, ways that you can find sort of a job or start working in sport, 
going from volunteering to courses to other things. And then one point I always touch on is you can kind of create your own job, right? Do your own thing. And, and in fact, as I said, the experience uh, that I have from, from friends in the Philippines is that they are very entrepreneurial. That's the way that they found to, to, to start working with it. So yeah, uh, great, uh, great advice. There yes, is in fact, yes, in fact, uh, athletes are entrepreneurial. The fact that you play sports, you're it's the same thing, right? Um, you're resilient, you can rise above adversity, you kind of learn how to talk to other people. Those are some of the skills that you can leverage into other things, uh, to life after sports. So, can we make that connection and make people realize that, oh, yeah, maybe I can, maybe I just have to take more courses so I could. I could go to that direction. So um, I think athletes also need to be taught and they are different kinds of learners. So if I want an athlete to be more entrepreneurial or to pursue entrepreneurship, probably fashion certain uh, courses that are more uh, for an athlete, maybe more experiential type of learning. Uh, they resonate more with that as opposed to like the books and stuff. So I, I'm all for creating your own venture, startups, and we've seen a lot of evidence of that during the pandemic. And so we will even have some of those uh, during the conference, how they were able, able to get to it. Definitely. Although books can also be very helpful whenever you're setting up your own, your own business. I want to show um, a comment here from uh, Shorty. She didn't say before, but she's actually in Trinidad and Tobago. And thanking you for the you. advice and for the for the motivation. Uh, you were the first Filipina accepted into that uh, global sports mentoring program for emerging women sports leaders. And that's the one that was under the U.S. State Department, which was headed by uh, Secretary Clinton, Hillary Clinton. Uh, tell us more about that. Uh, thank you. So uh, Secretary Clinton is a big proponent of empowering women. And so through this program of the State uh, Department of Sports Diplomacy, uh, there was this the inaugural year. So they, they received a lot of proposals from other organizations who want to pitch for such a program. And the one who was honored or given that uh, privilege to, to execute this program is the University of Tennessee Center for Sports, Peace, and Society. So their program was mentorship. So they get these women leaders, and, and obviously they would have to see that these women have had track records, especially for women in sports, and they would bridge them with other organizations. For example, if I wanted to know a little bit, they match. I'm looking for like a media company who will help me. So when I go back to the country, I will do, I'll be a women journalist for my country in sports. So I've had friends who were partnered with CNN or, or I'm sorry, ESPN. Um, I was personally uh, in a marketing, sport marketing group. They are a consumer product that uh, had bicycle teams. So I was mentored there and all of these things. So it is, it's a practitioner based type of mentorship. And so the expectation, obviously, is when you go back to your countries, then you will execute the program. And mine happened to be a sweep, aside from other outreach that I've done, whether it's sport for social change in uh, disaster areas. So I don't know, it's the bleeding heart in me that even though I want to really take off this organization and make it the super professional and all this organization, uh, the sport advocacy part is really eating a lot of my time. I would say that even this is my advocacy, which I want to bring forth to as much people as I can. Right. Yeah, you're um, you're, you're a pioneer there. So you're also um, is that the first executive director at the Philippines Sports uh, Commission? And yeah, that was a, that was interesting because yeah, to to have been main or at least the first female executive director. So that was that was an honor. Uh, even though it was a short term. Was there was there any other uh, women as executive director since you? 
Or is After, the only? I think only about two years ago, there was another one. But I was the first in 2010. Good, because we were seeing this um, now, the Oscar nominations, and, and, and especially, and people are celebrating because now they have a record of um, nominees of, of women, for instance, as for director. And it's the stunning, a stunning number of two. So, okay, it's better than, than before because you never had two before, but when you're celebrating, exactly. you have two, it's, I think it's uh, just a first step, right, to get uh, where you want. Yeah, you know what, uh, Joe? I mean, at the end of the day, um, we women just want to be seen as capable. We also don't want to be handed positions just because you're a woman, but we at least want you to see women like, hey, we're capable too. We don't have to do, do we have to prove ourselves all the time by doing double or triple your work? No, we're, we're equals. We want the same access to opportunities. We want to be able to be unencumbered to try out anything we want. So if this conference will help bring that, then I, I think my job is done. Like I said, I mean, if in five years time, I don't have to do these conferences, then we've done our job. Because women are empowered. Case closed. Okay. Do another do another project. That's a good <laughs> objective to have. Is uh, yes. basically not not needing to do that uh, event again. Exactly. By the way, we actually we would try. I mean, to to help and support as much as we can. A few Thank weeks you. ago, we had uh, uh, a representative from Siga here. Uh, so Katie had uh, an hour with us and promoting the uh, female leadership in, in sports conference that they had a few weeks ago. I don't know how much uh, you know about them, but I'll be happy to connect you guys. Um, we also work very closely with the uh, leadership women football. So they're based in Spain and they've been partnering with us. They will have, uh, they will participate in our events as well. So I'll be happy to, to connect with these uh, two important actors or actresses in the in the in the field. Now, uh, for people that you mentioned, that uh, people should create some of their own thing, uh, be as entrepreneur as they want, but also, I mean, they will be looking to apply for jobs that exist. You, I suppose, occasionally hire people to to help you with your events or or, or with the projects of sports field. Um, what are the the, the skills uh, that, that you look for when you're hiring? Wow, I'm very biased because I've worked with a lot of people and it is important for me that the people we hire do have a sports background. I think it cuts through a lot of the learning curve. Uh, that's all I could say. I've, I've tried to prove myself wrong otherwise, but there is an advantage if that person did have a sport background, so I would. I would you, you, you mean not only studying sport or working in the, the management side, you mean actually as an athlete? Yes, whatever athlete, uh, you're an enthusiast, but more the athletes because they understand. I, I For example, uh, social media. I mean, unless you are in sports, I don't think you really get it. Even as so far as doing a logo. A logo, I'm, I kid you not. I, I, I look at the logo and I said, well, do you play sports? <laughs> no, no wonder, I, I don't feel it. Uh, maybe it's the emotional part of sports. So you have to, you have, to have had that. But, just, but also I think even for the other uh, mainstream companies to hire somebody who has had uh, a sport background somewhere is also an advantage because they feel that these people already have some of the soft skills at least the soft skills that they're looking for. Are you a team player? Do you communicate well? Are, are you resilient? And I've heard even employers say, you know, I like hiring athletes because, you know, they're, they're tough in there. Even my department, even in my own department in school, my, my, my boss would say, you know what? It really shows you're an athlete. Yeah, why? How so? Well, if I give a task to somebody else, they wouldn't be still on it. You just keep going for it i mean you're not stopping and and that's why wow wouldn't it be great if our children uh, grew up if all of our children grew up with a good sport uh background 
because these are the skills that hone you for life. Do, do you think that that is the, your athlete side or your side or your athlete uh, history is the, the thing that allows you to to get to where you are now, being a sort of pioneer, a leading figure in, in women's sports? Perhaps, although when I was younger, are there I... Other, uh, sorry, are there other skills and traits that you would add to that that would explain uh, where you are at the moment? Well, um, even when I was younger, even when sport wasn't encouraged, I was already in sports because I wanted to keep healthy. I, I knew I was an overweight kid, so I, I really cared. Uh, I was more inclined to individual sports. And only later in life, in the Dragon Ball, did I even enter the team sport. So uh, even, even then, I still learned to think that I already had a master's degree, I already had companies, and even being in a sports situation enabled me to learn more. So I think even at any age, take a sport. Um, it's so applicable in so many aspects of, of, of your life. So is it, has it toughened me? Uh, many things. Our experiences build up upon each other. So one, one of the experience I could say is even the master's degree was so tough, right? So all these things build together. But sport, can you imagine at this late age, I've, I have still continued to learn. So please take it up if you, if you haven't. Take cool. something up. Right. Listen, uh, shout out here to Erica, to Yuri. Uh, Eric is in Lausanne, Yuri is in uh, Brazil, and uh, Nikos is in Brussels, um, watching us on LinkedIn and on YouTube. Um, by the way, if you want to send uh, some questions, I mean, this is this is a good time for that. Um, otherwise, this will be a little shorter. Um, it, uh, show today. Um, Dina, t so uh, talking about sport, not only let's talk a little less about management and administration, I want to talk to you as a sports fan. So what is your favorite sporting moment? Were okay. you competing? Were you watching? Oh, well, I have many sport well, I have many sporting moments. I I remember when I was in China and we were preparing for a race, so we had a tune up. And the Australian Navy said, Hey girls, would you wanna try and you know just have a little run? And of course my my teammates who are all women were shirking because this is the Australian Navy and they're all men. And I say, No, no. Don't back down because we need to get used to these challenges because when the time comes and we have to compete in higher competitions, I want to see the fire behind your eyes. I said, no shirking down. So, okay, let's go. And we ended up beating them. And so uh, I, I guess never say die. It's so important that when you have a team member that they have the same passion. That's why even in companies, Recruitment is so important because do they have the same values as you do, right? Will they act in the way uh, you want them to? So right. again, I, I get so, so many analogies. Other sporting moments, wow, it, it might show my age. I have a lot of great moments in sport that I can really look to. Like, for example, do you remember this American sprinter, uh, Flo Jo, Lawrence Joyner? She was yeah. so, well, she Florence was not your tip. Yes, Flo Jo, yes. She was so unorthodox. She wears makeup. She has long nails. Yeah, she has, un nails. yeah. That's why I like the, I like the 100 meter or the 200 meter dash because it ends so quickly, but you get to watch the slow motion. And I remember Flo Jo, you know, running first few hundred meters, uh, sorry, first few meters. And then at the moment, that she knew she was winning, she broke out into this beautiful smile. I like, I really like the sprints. I also remember Usain Bolt. Usain Bolt when he was in Beijing. Again, whoever thought a six foot four guy with this power would, would 
end up in a in a sprint race and he did and wow was he a power machine and then he went on to make history not once but two times uh, many more three times and, I, and I, 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 oh, three I, times okay <laughs> well th three times in each olympic games so about nine times although they they took some some medals away uh, because of the doping of um, one of his um, teammates but uh, yeah i was lucky to to see him uh, wow. live at the rio olympics wow and, and you know i'm sorry oh, go ahead go on sorry go on no I, want, I wanted to say that you know uh athlete life especially in the philippines or i would say i guess many other countries is really tough because some That uh, let me know in the comments if it, that froze for you too, please. Right now, that uh, we've got a question from Alex Diaz. Is that me or is it her who's frozen? If you can let me know in the comments, let me check on YouTube. check on YouTube. Sorry. Hi, you're back. You, you froze a bit. Can you can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, I can hear you. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. Uh, you're back. Yes, uh, such is the connectivity around here. No, I was saying that I guess, um, I guess every athlete has his own strife and we certainly had our share. So like I said, uh, uh, funding is scarce, but it should never have been, it should never be a hindrance because there are many other components to winning. There's the training, there's the support of your community, there are other enablers or supporters, and you can be creative. So when we didn't have funds, we sold stuff. We begged from people. We had to win first before you even they even look at you. And so that's right. exactly what we did. So the drama didn't even end as we were preparing for the for those crucial events because right. uh yeah i remember we were we we had we were waiting for funds because our concessionaire would have to feed 50 of us for the competition and the money was not coming and i was really tempted to even put it out of my pocket so i i recall i went to my car i cried myself out there because I never want the support of the, the food to stop. And then the concessioner caught me and she said, oh, it's okay, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll cover for it. So, uh, so, many, so many people who bolstered, bolstered us along the way. You know, that little, oh, uh, good luck, do well. I think to have sport competitions in your company, uh, in your country is also such a, such a gift because everybody's yeah. rallying behind you. So that was, those right. are great, yeah, those are great moments and experiences. Good, good. And, and listen, once we get um, a question here that I thought was um, really interesting, and we talked about many of your achievements, but uh, once we got a, a question for um, one of the guests, and then I repeated it with others, asking, what's your fav favorite failure or where you came short, and, and what are the lessons that you learned? Uh, or maybe it's something that really didn't work as you planned, you were upset, but you had an important learning from it. Do you have one? I, uh, let's put it this way. So, uh, like, when I worked in sport in, in the government, of course, again, to think that as an athlete, there were also issues and challenges and even when I was in government, there were issues and challenges. So as it happened, um, I had to get out of there. And I thought, I've had it with sports. I've, I've really had it. And one thing that I remember my husband telling me is, seek the moral high ground. Seek the higher ground. Don't grudge. Don't, don't, uh, don't sulk. Just go up. And I didn't understand it at the time. And so... 
what happened was eventually people actually came to me asking me, hey, do you want a position here? Do you want a position there? And so if it's meant to be, like I, I thought I was done with sports. I'm just going to go back to the mainstream and forget about it. It was a good ride, but I'm done. But, but for, for, uh, for people to validate, people to say, you still have what, you, what it takes. That's why even the sport mentoring program in the U.S. was such an eye-opener for me. Because for them to say, we like you, we like what you're doing, please come over. And so it has been my commitment to still stay in sports in one capacity or another. And, and to hopefully bridge the gaps of sport development here. Because there are so many. Again, like I said, before you bring that athlete to the elite level, it's a value chain all the way from maybe mass-based sports and making sure that that chain is supported so that you can bring that athlete all the way up. It's a, it's a tough thing. Right now, it's, it's all these pockets of efforts. But can you imagine if we are able to make it cohesive and as one in uh, and Unfortunately, here we are, well, fortunately for us, we have a very active civic society. Sometimes it, it need not entail government or government intervention to make things work here. For example, right. we have a disaster. We have a disaster. And sometimes even before government gets there, it's all these civic groups already mobilizing and getting there. So that's one thing that's quite interesting in this country. We Right. We, we are a caring nation, and it takes one person to care first, I believe. It takes one person right. to care first, and then other people will also start to care. Right. Great, uh, great, great lesson there. Uh, we had a couple of questions coming in um, as we move towards the, the end of the session. Just uh, Min Wukang in, in, in Korea uh, says hi as well. It's, as you see, it's a very international audience. We had people from yes. Switzerland, from Brazil, from Belgium, from India, from uh, all, all over. Um, so there are two questions that uh, came in. Let's uh, check them together. So Alex Diaz says, uh, how do you see the growth of the sport management program around the world? Do you think that uh, doing a master program uh, a good ent is a good entry po point? For a good career in sport, I think you touched on that on that initially, but maybe you can uh, address that question again. Um, I'll, I'll thank leave you. the question thank here. If you want. Oh yeah, um, how do you see the growth of sport management programs? Um, right now, I think many sport programs have had to rethink. Uh, probably, in in my observation, it has gone to like the super elite level and the high level type of sport business but i think people are, are forgetting those other parts of the value chain and guess what oh, the market is actually yeah the market is on the bottom the market is, is on the bottom so if we can revert back or at least refocus it's always been there but but maybe too much too much on top here let's focus down here community uh, grassroots, mass base. Uh, as for the master's degree, yes, it, it is important, but tell you what, you, I believe you have to have X number of years of experience. Master's degree are for people who have experience. You're supposed to contribute when you're in a master's degree program. You're supposed to exchange ideas with other individuals who are experienced. So if you come there right off undergrad, undergraduate degree, and you go jump into master's degree. I don't think you'll get the full experience and the full yeah. um, potential. So please, bide your time. Bide your time. Yeah. Many, uh, many, actually, many programs, in fact, require uh, some work experience after university for, for you to take the, take the master's. Yes. Yeah, so, in fact, yeah, don't hurry up. Don't, don't rush. You're young, especially if you're young, gain experience. So that when you get to the master's degree, hopefully maybe in your late 20s, you come more prepared and more ripe to, uh, to learn. So, Xiaowan, totally agree. Xiaowan, Hanhama. Uh, 
هذا ني هاو ني هاو شير شير اتس اول اي كان اي كان ساي and uh, i think actually answered as well uh, john mark's uh, question because i think it's pretty much the same thing he says having a sports related background like bachelor degree in physical education is there a need to go into a sports management separate course uh, well, actually it's a different question he has something in physical education and he wants to know if there's a need to go into sports management to enter into the sports management industry Do you, so would you suggest that he does this second course or since he has a, a bachelor maybe do a masters or there are other ways that you would recommend for him to to work in sports management Hi John Mark thank you for that question I, um all these skills will help you in the long run so if eventually you find yourself wanting to get into a sport management industry or a field then I would suggest that you take a course. If you're uh, in the Philippines, actually, we have a hybrid physical education, uh, physical education with, I think, a minor in sport and recreation management, only because they see the industry and they realize that as a physical education graduate, it might not prepare you for these other jobs like in the fitness industry or the recreation. So here we actually have a hybrid now. So I, I'm not sure in the other countries, but so if you feel that you're lacking and you also want to venture, then you have that sport management degree. So somebody who looks at you will see, oh, I, oh wow, John Mark has all these skills. I can hire him as a physical educator because he has management skills or, or as a manager, I can hire John Mark because he also happens to have physical education background. So it, it's all good. Uh, I think they're all related and it's all to your advantage. Right. Uh, good advice there. Listen, we, we're going to we get into the end, uh, Dina, uh, of the this sort of interview. But before we go, as we normally do here at the end of the show, we ask you to recommend a book uh, for people that are starting their, their careers in, in sports, if there's any any book that you recommend, or perhaps if you're more into a podcast, into podcasts, or or if you've been watching YouTube channels that you think are valuable for them, um, what would you recommend? I There's a podcast I listen to. It's I think it's Counterpoints by Professor Ben, uh, Ben Stills from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So he has... He has talks about, well, I, number one, I like his speaking style. He's very clear, uh, simple. He will talk about analytics. He might talk about social media and sports. So I, I find myself listening to, to him uh, all the time. And uh, for, for books, I, I personally like textbooks by Dr. Pakiana Tanchela Durai. He is a sport management guru. Probably he was there from the start. When sport management happened in North America, he was already there. He's in his 90s. He's still teaching. He's an author of so many books, uh, even books uh, that's uh, of uh, Olympic uh, for the Olympic uh, organization. Say, say his name again. Pakyanathan Cheladurai. Breathe his name in in North America, and they they know him. I, I guess pretty much everywhere else. Um, a dear yeah. friend and uh, wow, some of the greatest mind in sport management. Uh, that that's great. That's great. Um, Dina, th thank you so much. Listen, I'm looking forward to speaking at uh, Sweep uh, next week. And the same way you shared, you know, your knowledge here, I'll try to give some of my own advice there to to your audience. Let's see how, how that works. But uh, as I said, if you want as well to connect with other women in sport uh, organizations here uh, sorry, in Europe, I'll be happy to, to put you in, in, in touch with them. Uh, I uh, was super well, so you got uh, to me super well referred by a friend in common, so Jane, who did some work with us at uh, I Work in Sport. She was fantastic. So. I uh, thank her for the work that she has done, but also for putting us in touch. So that was great. Don't go anywhere. I just want to 
leave a, sort of a last announcement to everyone that is still watching here, which is a quick reminder that in about three weeks time, we'll have uh, the Education Virtual Expo and some of the best programs in sport management there, mostly masters and, and MBAs, but there are other options of courses as well. So there's a link in, in the description. So check it out. You can register for free. You'll get to meet their, their staff and talk to them, to their alumni, learn about their courses. So do that. And before we go, Dina, any last message that you would like to, to give? Um, my last advice. I, I think if you want to work in sport, I, I would really advise that remember what it is for. I, I think people, when they get they get into a sport job, they like it, but probably probably forget why we do it in the first place. So don't lose don't lose those ideals of why it's important to to uh, to be in sport management or to be in the sport industry, because the, yeah. the best is to enable many of us, as much people, to experience the joy of sport yeah. in whatever capacity. Yeah, definitely great advice 100% so I want to thank everyone that is still watching us here uh, today we had a little less so people uh, watching and that's probably also because we changed the time um, at, at the last minute normally we do our interviews at the end of the day at five or six o'clock here not at uh, lunch time but uh, sorry uh, that's, that, that, that's that's fine. That's fine. And people will be... The great thing about this is that they can watch the replay too. So that is great. But for everyone that uh, was here watching live, thank you so much. If you can still hit that like button, if you're watching it on YouTube, we'd appreciate it. And if you like that kind of content, um, these interviews, and you want to hit, uh, get the notification, hit that the bell sign as well. So I'm going to say bye to all of you. Dina, thanks again. Thanks, everyone. See you soon. Thanks, everyone.